Miracles when you move Such an easy thing for you to do if you would please. Rodney already told you to turn there. He didn't know that. But turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew, the 28th chapter. Glory to God. Matthew, 
the 28th chapter. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 28. How many of you are glad you're saved? Come on, how many of you are glad you're born again today? What, wouldn't it be great if Jesus came back today? Man, wouldn't it be great? Well, I mean, we can leave here shouting. But listen, he is coming soon. I mean, it could be, I, I believe this is going to be the generation. Hallelujah. So just keep hanging around. Glory to God. I want to be raptured out. Anybody else with me? How many of you want to be raptured out? Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, open your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew. Matthew, the 28th chapter. I want to begin to talk to you today about an earthquake on Easter morning. Everybody say, an earthquake on Easter morning. But, you know, this is a God kind of earthquake. And sometimes in our thinking about God, we have this distorted vision, and we're going to have to go back and reassess our thinking about God, and we're going to have to go back and reassess some of the things that we've read under the Old Testament, and because we're going to begin to find out that, how many of you know that Satan was under the Old Testament also, and sometimes the King James traits it like God is doing it, but if you study in the Hebrew, it meant God permitted it. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Every time you find something happen in the Old Testament uh, of damaging and people dying, it's because people are disobedient. Everybody say, people are disobedient. And how many know, when you're disobedient, you're not in the light. Everybody should have been saying amen. Because if you're not in the light, then you're not in the protection of God. And so I want us to go to Matthew, the 28th chapter, starting at verse 1, and I'm going to read all the way down to verse 10, and then I'm going to go skip over a couple of verses and then read verse 18, 19, and 20. Then we're going to go down through here, and we're going to begin to look at some things that happened that we're in celebration of today and our victory that Jesus gave us. Everybody say, I have the victory, not because of me, but because of Jesus. Let's begin reading Matthew, the 28th chapter, verse 1. It said, In the end of the Sabbath, which is a Saturday, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, which is Sunday, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. Everybody say great earthquake. Notice it doesn't say an earthquake. It says what kind of an earthquake? Everybody say great earthquake. For, notice, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake, and you want to get a good laugh, and became as dead men. In other words, the power of God hit them. We call it in the charismatic circle. They got slain in the spirit. But let's read on. Verse 5, And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear ye not, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, but he is risen. As he said, Come and see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed, how church? Quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy. Boy, imagine that at the same time. And did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, not to the ladies, all hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and where, church? And earth. How much power? All power in heaven and where? On earth. Anybody on earth today? Who's got the power today? 
Come on, everybody say, we do. And how many know we got it because he got it? Everybody say, amen. Now, there was a time he couldn't claim that. We'll look at that later. Verse 19, he said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. How many nations? All nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am what church? With you, everybody say, Jesus said, he is with me. How often? Come on, how often, church? Who's with you today? The Lord is with you today, isn't he? I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, let's go back to verse 1 of Matthew, the 28th chapter. Matthew chapter 28, verse 1, we find two Marys. One is Mary Magdalene. I want to bring a little history to you to remember the story about Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was the woman that Jesus cast seven devils out of. She was demon-possessed by seven different spirits. Mary Magdalene is also the woman you'll find it listed, I believe, in John's Gospel or Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, or John's chapter 12, where we found out that Mary, after she was delivered, She's following the Lord. We could say she's a disciple of the Lord. And, uh, of course, that's her deliverer. Everybody say, Jesus is my deliverer. And literally, he literally delivered her from demonic power. And so what happened? She had this alabaster box, and it was very expensive. And the Bible tells us it was very expensive. I remember a teaching that I did on it several years ago. If I remember right, that uh, one of the commentaries began to talk about the value of the ointments and the perfumes that was in this alabaster box, and it was worth about an average one month's salary for a human being, which means it was very expensive. Everybody say very expensive. And what did she do? Well, we know that Jesus is about to leave earth. He's about to be crucified. They're at the Last Supper. She comes, and what does she do? She pours that expensive perfume on Jesus' head. And if you read all four of the accounts, apparently it got down to the place where it ran down upon him and over him, and it ran down all the way to his feet. When it got down to his feet, what did she do? She began to take her hair. She must have had long hair, and she began to rub that anointing and wipe it with that anointing upon Jesus' feet as she worshiped him. And, of course, like anybody, a lot of people get mad. Some of his disciples said, boy, what a waste. Is there anything too valuable that you can give to God that is greater? He, I mean, he's given us so much more than what we could ever give back. This woman is appreciative that she's been delivered. And so what's happening? It's Easter morning. It's the day after the Sabbath day. It's Sunday. The Bible says it's the first day of the week. I don't know if you know this or not, but when any time you buy a calendar, even today, at least in the United States, the first day of the week on our calendars is Sunday. Every time you look at the first day in any calendar you'll get in America, it's Sunday. Everybody say, it's Sunday. And, of course, you know, really some people say, well, should we worship God on Sunday or Wednesday or Tuesday? I really believe in the New Testament we're to worship God every day. It doesn't specifically say when to. It just says do it. That's why I think sometimes I remember speaking at a church years gone by when I just come back from Ramah, they didn't have Wednesday night services. They had Thursday night services. And somebody said, well, what's right or wrong? Well, I think you just need to be led by God, and whatever God tells you to do, you need to do what he says do. After all, he's leading us. Everybody say, he's leading us. So these two ladies, everybody say Mary and Mary. So they're going to the sepulcher. Now, I want you to notice something. They're going to the sepulcher not because they remembered what he said. They're going to the sepulcher because the Sabbath they can't leave. That's Saturday. They're staying at home. They're good Jews. They're going to listen. But Mary, she wants to go and she wants to anoint the body. We would call it our modern-day embalming process. And they're going to go there and take these precious ointments because now the Sabbath has passed. And so she's going to do that, listen, because she forgot he said, I will rise again in three days. But because of her love for him, 
He's the deliverer. That was where her faith was at. That was where her hope was at. Come on, church. It was laying in a grave. All of their hope, the love of God in that grave, in that tomb, their faith in that tomb. And she's so grateful that he delivered her, she wants to go there and honor him. But she wasn't going there based on the revelation you and I have. We know what happened. They forgot about it. But aren't you glad? Despite ourselves, God still comes through. Because, listen, if we're waiting to be perfect and get everything lined up, we'll never be able to be used by God because we're all growing. And our hearts can be perfect, but we still got things we have to grow. We still have sometimes flesh sticking out. We still say things that we shouldn't be saying. We still have thoughts that we shouldn't be taking. And despite that, God said, I'll use you. Everybody say, God said he'll use us. And so here's these two grieving women. Now, you and I, we're not grieving today. We're celebrating today. We know. We can go back. How I many know everybody's got 2020 hindsight? But they're living this thing out day by day. The deliverers in the grave. And by the way, you have to understand where they're at. And even today, if you tell people this, even today people will get sarcastic. And people will get smuggish about it. When was the last time you heard somebody in your life say, just want you to know I'm going to die this day, and three days later I'm coming back? And it actually happened. None of us had that testimony, do we? So before we look down at them and kind of belittle them and, oh, man, they should have paid attention. Oh, man, they, they should have been. Well, how many remember Doubting Thomas? I mean, all the other disciples, they believed that Jesus was alive and well, and Thomas said, I don't care what everybody says. How I many of you always got one stick in the mud? Everybody else was ready to run, and you got that one stick in the mud. I ain't going to believe God. I ain't going to. And that's what Doubting Thomas. Can you imagine the testimony of Doubting Thomas when we get to heaven? Hey, Thomas, how in the world could you doubt? And he might look at us and go, why don't you go to the prayer room now? Because he probably doesn't want to hear that the rest of his life. Because if you study further in some other books, Thomas actually got his act together. And he became a great minister for God. God put those things in there for you and I to be privy so we don't make the same mistake. Not so we look down at them and say, oh, my. You know, sometimes we want to do that with Adam and Eve. And to be honest with you, if Adam and Eve didn't do it, somebody else would have done it sooner or later. But nevertheless, we got a deliverer. So their faith was small. They're going to embalm the body. They're not going there because they're expecting to see him. They think he's dead. That's why they're going to embalm him. And they're in for a great surprise. Everybody say great surprise. And so what happens? We find an earthquake. Notice in verse 2. And it said, and behold, there was a great earthquake. Everybody say great earthquake. I call this earthquake the God kind. What kind of earthquake is that, Pastor? The God kind of earthquake is where God shakes the place and nothing gets damaged. Nothing gets destroyed. By the way, this is not the first time this happened. We find nothing being destroyed, nothing was destructive, nothing whatsoever. Remember, Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly, but he also started off first with, the thief cometh not but for to what, church? Steal and what? And to destroy. Look at your name and go, God's not into destroying. If something gets destroyed, don't blame God. Somewhere somebody missed it and got away from the hedge of protection of God. And listen, the enemy will be there to destroy things in a heartbeat. But God here has a great earthquake. Nothing is broken. Nothing is damaged. By the way, it's not the first time you study Peter when he was in prison. There was an earthquake. Things were shaken. Doors popped open. Angels show up. Paul's there in Silas. Earthquake. Things were shaken. Nothing being destroyed. Everybody say, we have a good God. And so what happens in verse 2? It said, and behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord. Everybody say, angel of the Lord. Now, if you study your Bible, you'll find out that there are classes of, uh, classes of angels. 
you have personal angels. There is the archangel. There is the angel of the Lord. There are seraphims. Come on, everybody say seraphims. There are other classes of angels uh, that we see in the Bible, but this angel is the angel of the Lord. Everybody say, the angel of the Lord. How many of you know that you have your own personal angel assigned to you? How many of you know that? Raise your hand. Sure. Whose angel is this? This is the angel, everybody say, of the Lord. And so what's going on here? And so the angel of the Lord, he descends from heaven. There's a great earthquake. Things are happening. The ladies are there. And, and, I, and I love this part. And the stone at the grave is rolled away. Everybody say, the stone at the grave is rolled away. Now, remember, this was sealed. It was sealed because the Jews went to the Roman government and said, hey, this guy said three days he's coming back. We need some guards. Seal that thing up. Seal that tomb up so nobody can steal the body or a, the Bible says, or a worse thing will happen. But how many know the power of God is nothing for a stone against a stone? And, and I like this. It's so funny. Notice what happens here. And it says in verse 2, the angel descended from heaven and came back and rolled, everybody say, rolled back the stone from the door. Now notice this part. And what did he do, church? He just sat upon it. Everybody say he sat upon it. Now, if you read Luke's account, you'll find out there were two angels there. Matthew doesn't say this. If you want to get the full account, you're going to have to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But Matthew says, and I like this, and it's almost like sometimes we wonder if God is big enough, if God is powerful enough. Can he, he really do this? And here is this stone, and I don't know if he specifically came down or the power of God just rolled it or if the angel come down there and took his hand and just kind of rolled that thing down. But if he did that, then listen, he's just sitting on the rock going, anything else you'd like me to do today, Father? Took men to get that. We got the stone rolled away, no problem, no hindrance. And I'm just going to sit here on it. What happens when people have to exert extreme energy and pressure to do something? Man, they want to take a break. Here's an angel. The stone's rolled away, and he's just sitting on it. Everybody say, just sitting on it. It's like he's letting people know that the Father God is the master of the grave, that the Father God's power is greater than some stone placed in front of it. It's not going to hold us down. And so what happens? We find it in verse 2 that the stone is rolled back, the stone from the door, and he's just sitting there upon it. And what's going on with the stone being rolled away? The stone is uh, telling you and I something. It's telling us that victory over death was made official. Now we think, what's the big deal about that? Well, we're going to explain what the Scripture is saying just a little bit. But that stone being rolled away means victory over death. Get that. Understand that. Now go with me in your Bibles to John, the 11th chapter, a very familiar scripture to us. Here Jesus had not died, had not been persecuted, had not been crucified, and he begins to tell them beforehand. I want you to think about this. Can you imagine the things that they saw Jesus do? And then he's telling them, hey, listen, guys, in three days, in three days I'm coming back. And it's obvious that they didn't believe it because these two ladies weren't going there for that reason. They were going there thinking he's dead. But how many of you know you can forget something God told you and you have to continue to hold fast to it? Because it might be the difference between you walking in fear or walking in faith. And notice what happens here in John, the 11th chapter. Donnie, do you have John chapter 11, verse 25? Would you read John chapter 11, verse 25? John, the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verse 25. And listen, listen to what Jesus said that he is. John eleven twenty-five. 25. Donnie, would you read it loudly, please? Everybody say this with me. Jesus is the resurrection and the what, Donnie? 
and the life. Is that correct? What is Jesus to you and I? The resurrection and the what? And the life. What life does God want you to have? He wants you to have a life with Jesus. Death is not for you and I to be fearful about any longer. Jesus conquered the grave. I have personally known individuals, Christians, love God. And I've seen them because they knew that their days were just days away. They knew they were going to be to heaven. But the word death to them, you could just see the fear, the torment. What is it going to be like? What do I, how am I going to be? What's going to, go, what's going to take place? Listen, we don't have to be fearful about dying because we're not going to die. I so I want to challenge your thinking. I want you to think beyond the physical realm. That, that's some of the problem that we have. All we think about is the physical and not the realms that God and Jesus are talking about. And Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. Everybody say, Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. And God is still moving stones that are in our way so we can get into faith. Don't let any obstacle, as Rodney said, no obstacle stop you. Oh, Paul said, you know, Satan hindered me. But hindering and stopping are two different things. The only way the enemy can win in your life is if you quit on God. If you stop, God has to stop. Pastor, why does he have to stop? Because he's working with you. He will not override your will. If your will says, I'm done, I'm finished, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to go any further, if God proceeded forward, then he would be overriding your will. And God is not going to override our wills. Everybody say amen. So my job is just to stay hooked up with God. Now notice here in verse 3, everybody say fear versus faith. And so here's fear. We find there's guards there, they're in fear. The ladies, they're in fear. Does God want his people to be in fear? There is a godly fear, but godly fear doesn't torment. Godly fear doesn't punish you and have anguish and you just feel restless and like it's, it torments you. That's not what godly fear is. Godly fear is a reverence, a respect, and awe. But that's not what they're talking about here now. They're not, things are happening that all of a sudden our minds go tilt. Remember, these two ladies, they're coming to do what? Embalm the body. Now they have a supernatural, angelic being in front of them. Now the Bible does tell us in the epistles that we may entertain strangers unaware, making reference to angels. But it says, unaware. But these angels showing up are very much on their alert system. Their clothes are bright. Their faces are bright like lightning. The supernatural power is there, the power of God, fear. And when you see something your mind can't comprehend because it's supernatural, what happens? Your senses will kick in. And fear begins to crop up because you're not sure what to do and you're not sure what's going on. And when you can't figure out what's going on, the enemy likes to bring in fear. But our God is a supernatural God. I said he's a supernatural God. That's why we call him God, right? Because he can do the God thing. He can do the things we can't do. It's not an issue for him. It's really an issue for us. And so this resurrection, these ladies are seeing things. There's a great earthquake. They're seeing angelic beings in front of them that are talking to them. And as we read this, they not only are talking to them, they know why they're there. And they begin to tell them what they're to do. You talk about having your mail read. This is what's going on. 
I know Brother Mike's going to be here tonight. I encourage you to be here. Brother Mike has, God uses him a lot in gifts of spirit. And, you know, people, you just see people, particularly visitors come, and he'll have a word for them. It just nails things right out. And, and, and they go, how do you know that? He said, I don't. God does. Because God knows everything. I said, God knows everything. I said, God knows everything. Verse 3, notice it begins to describe these angels. His countenance was like lightning. And his raiment or his clothing was white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as what church? Dead men, slain in the spirit. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear ye not. Everybody say, Fear not. Look at him and go, God doesn't want you to be in fear. Fear ye not, for I know that you seek Jesus which was crucified. And they're like, How do you know? Well, I'm here from God. We know it. And it goes on to tell us, verse 6, He is not here, for he is risen. As he, what church? As he said. Everybody say, as he said. Remember, I believe one of the reasons that they said that was because they forgot that. They forgot that he was going to rise. Boy, you have to be careful what you forget. If God gives you a word in due season and he gives you a revelation, you need to write it down. You don't want to forget it. You might not need it then, but when God gives you an eye revelation, it's coming when you're going to need that. They forgot that. And so here's the angel reminding them, and he said, as he said. And Jesus did tell them that this was going to happen, but they forgot. And he said, he is not here. He is risen. As he said, come, see the place. Where the Lord lay. And so here's these guards, Roman guards. They're afraid of the angel. There's great fear. Everybody say great fear. And, and I'll be honest with you, these, these Roman guards, they had reason to be fearful. Why? Because they're on the other side. They're not following in the kingdom of God. And now they realize the power of God is being displayed Angels of the Lord are coming down. Their raiment and their faces are lit up. The anointing of God is strong. How many times do we see when angels show up anywhere in the Old or the New Testament, one of the first things they say is fear not. Why? Your mind just it, your mind can't comprehend it. It can't grasp, oh, pastor, I know the Bible. I'll be ready. Okay, when it happens, let us know. You're going to be just like everybody else. That's why God repeats it and puts it in this word, fear not. Because, see, when your mind can't comprehend something, it gets in fear because your mind wants to be able to comprehend it so it can control it. But you can't control the supernatural. That's why it's called the supernatural. Not the natural, but the supernatural. Everybody say the supernatural. And so these guys have reason to be fearful. They're on the wrong side of the plan of God. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, write the verse of Scripture down, Jesus said in his earthly ministry, he said, you're either for me or you're what church or you're against me. These guys might have realized it, and what happened? The power of God hit them, and the Bible says they fell like dead men. Well, we know they didn't fall. They weren't dead. They not, it, said, it said like dead men. We know it's the power of God. How does this happen, Pastor? When you lay hands on people and they go down the floor, why do they do that? Your body can only handle so much power. When it has the power of God hit it, something is going to give, and it's going to be your body. Just like in the natural, we have electricity in the natural. How many of you know that? How many of you have ever come in contact with electricity in the natural? If you get enough of it, what can it do? You can be not like dead, but you can be dead. God's power is electricity in the spirit. And when you get an overload, when you get too much, your body can only handle so much. Remember, our bodies are limited. Thank God there's coming a day where they won't be limited. But right now they're limited. They can only handle so much. As a matter of fact, one of the great things about the resurrection is we're going to get glorified bodies. Everybody say glorified bodies. What does that mean? They're going to be glorified by the power of God. We'll be able to handle it then. But now 
This physical being can only handle so much, and when it gets in the overload, you're going to give, or your physical man is going to give. And so what happens? It looked like they were dead, but they didn't. The ladies also had reason to be in fear. Why? An earthquake. I've never been in an earthquake. Never been around it. Seen it on TV. Seen the effects of an earthquake. Remember, this is not just an earthquake. This is a great earthquake. These ladies are not expecting to see that tomb open or empty. They're coming to embalm the body, to put the ointments and the scents on it, to do those things that is necessary. You don't do that when the body begins to decay. We know in the natural around here, we're familiar with what happens when an animal is hitting its lay there. It begins to smell and it begins to stink. If you remember when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, uh, the one lady, she said, Lord, by now his body stinketh because the body's decaying and it begins to smell. And so they're coming there to do that. So there's lots of surprises. Everybody say lots of surprises. And we think, oh, well, I know about this. is no big deal. No, you'd have been the same way too. Actually, Luke's recording says that when the angels spoke to them, they bowed their faces. I believe they were submitting to a superior being. They realized the power. They realized it was godly and it was from God. Everybody say it was from God. Now, I want to say something to you the Lord reminded me about, that we have to be careful anytime we have a supernatural visitation. Because just because it's supernatural doesn't mean it's from God. Everybody listening. The Bible tells us in the New Testament, that over in 2 Corinthians, the Bible tells us that we have to be careful putting our faith in supernatural visitations because it tells us that Satan himself can appear as an angel of light. Everybody understand that? In other words, the enemy will come as an angel of God, and he's coming to deceive. Everybody say coming to deceive. See, a lot of people that are looking for the spectacular, they can be deceived because you have to know what the Word says so that you're not deceived if something happens spectacular to you. Now, these angels we know are from God. First of all, the Word tells us. But secondly, what do we do if we have an encounter like this? Well, angels that are sent from God are sent to encourage you, and they come to confirm the Word. When the enemy comes, he's not coming to confirm the Word. He's hoping that you'll put your faith in an experience and trust that over what the Word says. See, even if you have a supernatural visit, you always go back to the Word. Everybody say, always go back to the Word. Our final authority in everything we do, we always run back to the Word. But pastor, I had a supernatural experience. Run back to the Word. This happened, and what was said, does it go along with the Word of God? Everybody say, Word of God. Remember, this is my instruction manual. How many of you got your Bible in front of you? Raise it up. That's your instruction manual from God. In other words, everything that, and listen, people can get supernatural experiences all the time. I, I, I remember people that are dealing in drugs. Uh, many, of you, uh, many of you may or may not, uh, there's probably a few of you that don't know, but there used to be a young man, he's been with the Lord about six years now, I believe, uh, and Mike Devers, and Mike told me, he said, you know, he said, after I got filled with the Holy Ghost, he said, it just dawned on me. He said, I remember before I was saved and in drugs, I would have visions all the time. He said, only the visions that I would see were demonic spirits. And he said, I remember coming down, coming down off the mountain one night, and he said, man, I was hiring a kite. I was taking drugs. And he said, I looked off the side, and I thought it was just a man, a hitchhiker. And he said, when I drove by it, it wasn't, it was a demonic spirit. See, that's what drugs do. It'll give you a supernatural. It'll place you into the supernatural. But if you don't measure it with the Word of God, then you'll take it and accept it that it's from God and be deceived. Now, write this scripture down. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, the Bible tells us that Satan is a deceiver. Everybody say Satan is a deceiver. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, that he deceived all nations. In other words, he is so good at deceiving people, he deceived people from around the world. Why? If I don't know this word, 
I can be deceived. Yeah, but it's supernatural. Doesn't matter. The enemy has supernatural. Go back and look at Moses. The, the, the warlocks came out, and they had supernatural powers, but it wasn't as great as God. Everybody say, it wasn't as great as God. But these are angels from God. And notice these women, they're in fear, and fear is normal under some conditions, particularly the fear of God. But how many of you know this, that faith, everybody say faith, will drive away all fears. Everybody say it with me. Faith will drive away all fears. And so what is these angels doing to these ladies? Getting them over to the Word. Giving them a good Word. Why? So they can get off of him being dead to good news that he's alive. Everybody say, he's alive. And how many of you know, when you hear the good news, Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto Christ. The word gospel, look it up in the Greek, it means a good message. The Bible that you have in front of you is not a ball and chain. It's a good message. Read it, and you'll find out God is good. Everybody say, it's a good message. But see, that's what I get from the Word. I get good news. I get victory. And, so, and that's what the angels are doing. The angels want these two ladies to listen to what I'm telling you. Listen to what I'm saying. He's not here. I know you're here, but he's not here. He has risen. And oh, by the way, he told you he was going to arise. What's he want me to do? Get over on the Word. Everybody say, get over on the Word. This is what we have to do when we feel like we're behind the eight ball. Get over on the Word. Run to the Word and get the good news. And so notice, what did he say here? Go back, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 2. Fear, faith drives away all fears. It drives away all fears. Go to Hebrews, the second chapter. Hebrews, the second chapter. Now, I'm going to read something to you that most people, even in the charismatic circle, we don't touch on very much, but it's part of our benefit. It's part of the package that God has given us. And we're talking about death, hell, and the grave. Yeah, Jesus, yeah, he defeated death, hell, and the grave. But really, what does that mean for me? I know he did it, but how does that apply to me? Well, go to Hebrews, the second chapter, and verse 9. Do you have it? If you do, say, I got it. Hebrews, the second chapter and verse 9, notice the writer said in verse 9, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of what church? Death. Was Jesus coming to suffer for death? Yes, he was. Everybody say suffering of death. Was he the Son of God? Was he the Son of God? Yes, he was. But notice, he may be the Son of God, but he's still subject to death. God is not subject to death. Jesus on earth was subject. Why? He became just like you and I. He stripped himself of everything, and he said, No, Father. Or the Father said, No, Jesus, you can't take any royalties, can't take any powers. You can't take anything with you. I'm going to have you born as a human being would be, and you're going to be there, and you're going to live on earth just like they do. You're going to come down to their level. I'm going to go down to their level through you, and then we're going to show them how I want them to live on earth so they can have victory even over death. Now, I've done in my, since I've been a pastor, probably... 25, maybe 30 funerals, maybe more. And there's a couple of funerals that I remember. We're talking about Jesus having victory over death, hell, and the grave. We're talking about how does it apply to you and I. And I remember the funeral. Actually, there was like two funerals of young people. I say young, they both were driving, but I don't think they were, oh, they might have been 20. They were really young. I didn't know them. 
knew nothing about him, never been to church. I got a phone call. Both instances happened about a month apart, these two funerals. Uh, from people that came to church, somebody invited them here. And, that, and that's the only connection they knew with the pastor or ministry. And they called. And so what are you going to do? You're going to take the funeral. I said, the only thing I need from you is I, I just need to come over and talk to you a little bit so I can get a little bit of information. And so I went to the viewing. And I remember going to the viewing, and because they were young, there was a lot of young people. Some of them weren't even driving yet, but there was a lot of them. They were 16, 17, 18 year old, a lot. And I remembered some of them, most of them stood all the way to back. Like if this would be the funeral and the, and the site, the, the, the coffin would appear, they would stay way back against the wall and they would be up against the wall. Like they were in there, but they wanted to get as far back from what's going on up front because up front is death. And they thought that couldn't happen to them. And every once in a while, one would break rank and another friend would go with them and they would, they would come up to the coffin and they, they would look into the casket and then they would come back and then they would go back in. And you could see the fear. Listen, you could see the fear of death. They were in fear of death. Are you with me? It controls people. Do you know we have that same thing going on today? How do we do, Pastor? I told my wife and maybe two other people, one of them was a minister, a couple of months ago I was meditating on the Word and the Lord began to show me some things about really what's been going on, whether you call it COVID-19 or whether you call it the China virus. And the Holy Ghost said to me on the inside, He said, you know, people don't act the way they act unless they're in fear. And I'm like, uh, and how many know when God talks to you, most of the time you're kind of getting the gist of what He's saying? And I said, yes, sir, that's right. He said, People don't wear masks because they're fearful of getting sick. He said, they're wearing masks because they're fearful of dying. And I said, yeah. He said, people don't act wild-eyed and do the crazy things they're doing because they're fearful about getting sick. He said, they're fearful of dying. And I mean, man, revelation, I was like, yeah, yeah. I realized the enemy and the media playing up sickness, but really their trump card is death. Some of you are getting it. You meditate on it, you'll see it. Because we've had viruses and viruses and viruses and different strands and all kinds of sicknesses and diseases, and people never, ever in our lives ever acted like this. This is not about sickness and disease, church. It's about death. The enemy is propagating death. You're getting it. I began to see it. And he said, the way they look at you. He said, it's not about the sickness. He said, the enemy has planted, you're going to die. You're going to die. He just using the paper as a cover by calling it COVID-19 or the China virus. It's just the paper, but the real gift is death. Now listen, we are seeing with our own eyes how people react when they're confronted with death. We're here today to celebrate somebody that defeated death, hell, and the grave. You have the answer. That tells us that society in this country and all around the world, they are not ready to meet Jesus. They are fearful of dying. How about we give them some good news so they can live? So that every time you see it, 
What other sickness and disease have you ever heard in your life? The Lord said, what other sickness and disease have you ever heard in your life where they use public media and tell you how many people are dying from it? I said, man, I got it, Lord. I got it. I got the revelation of it. And I believe many of you got a hold of it. It's not about sickness and disease. It's about death. Because, listen, that's what the enemy wants to do. He's promoting death. Because that's what he is. I'm here to tell you something. I'm talking about Jesus. He's promoting life. Hallelujah. And he's not just promoting life, but life more abundantly. Now, go to Hebrews, the second chapter, verse 9. You ready for this? Death will paralyze people. That's exactly what we've got going on. People are afraid to go out of their homes. I mean, they're, going, they're doing things we have never seen, and it's because of death. It's not because of the China virus. That's just the pitch tone. The real result is they're afraid of dying. Oh, if I don't wear my mask, I'm going to die. No, I'm going to live, bless God. I'm going to say, I'm going to live. See, the enemy wants you to get in fear because he can control you. And if you're fearful of dying, he will control you. He will manipulate you. He will have you do all kinds of things that you will never believe that you're doing, all because you're fearful of dying. No child of God should be in fear of dying. We should be going, bless God, I am not going to die. Hallelujah. Just say what the Bible says. But they'll think I'm crazy. Well, listen, who cares what they say? They're lost and you're not. Just say what the Bible says. Hebrews, the second chapter, verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of what church? Of death. Jesus knew he was going to die, and you can't find one place in the Bible where he was timid or fearful about it until you get to the Garden of Gethsemane. And I don't think he was fearful of dying. I think he was fearful about his separation from the Father. Never happened. Him and the Father, he said in John 17, were one. Man, when you've been one with somebody and you lose them, you're going to miss them. Everybody say amen. Because he knew he's the answer to defeating death. You don't have to be fearful of the word death. That's what happens when people, that's the exact thing that happens when people get cancer. I'll tell you exactly what the enemy does when the doctor says you have cancer. The enemy takes a back door to your brain and starts planting thoughts into your mind. You're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. Why? Now he can control you and keep you in fear. God wants his people out of fear. Hallelujah. He said, crowned with glory and honor, everybody say glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste, everybody say should taste, that Jesus should taste what church? Come on, church, everybody say taste death. Who did he taste death for? For what? Everybody say for everybody. Why? Because Satan for thousands of years has been controlling and manipulating people by death. His favorite word he has been telling humanity for years and years, even up to today, only because we don't know what Jesus delivered us from, is you're going to die. I got news for you. My body is, but I'm not going to die. And I got news for you. My body's only going to be temporarily in there. It's coming out a glorified body. So you can't keep me down, my physical man, very long. Our brothers and sisters are going to come back glorified bodies. Notice he tastes death for every man. Why? He's my deliverer. Everybody say, I don't have to be fearful of dying. Say it again. I don't have to be fearful of dying. I'm thinking of a man that I did his funeral probably, oh, my, that is probably about, we probably weren't even in this sanctuary. He had been saved all his life. I'm seeing his face now. I know who he is. And him and he loved God. And I said, how long have you been saved? He said, all of my life. And this man was mid to early 80s, mid 80s. He said, all of my life, as long as I can remember, I was a Christian. But I watched him his last few days. He would not go to sleep. He was fearful of closing his eyes because he was fearful of dying. That's not how God wants us to go. We shouldn't fear anything. The only thing we should fear is God, and that's not a torment. 
we should look at it like, glory to God, I get to go to heaven. Everybody say, I get to go to heaven. Notice in verse 10, it said, For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation. Everybody say, Jesus is the captain of our salvation. He said, perfect or mature through sufferings. Verse 11, for both he that sacrificeth and they who are sanctified are all of one, are, are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them what church? Brethren. What does Jesus call you and I? He calls us brothers and sisters, obviously. He said, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. Verse 14. Now notice verse 9, underlined at the bottom, Jesus tasted death for me. Everybody say, Jesus tasted death for me. Remember this, death is an enemy of God. Say it with me. Death is an enemy of God. Say it again. Death is an enemy of God. The Bible says it's the last enemy that will totally be defeated and destroyed. Jesus came to bring us what? Life. Jesus came also. He experienced death, but he tasted it for every one of us. Why? Anytime you find Jesus being a sacrifice for you, that means he doesn't want you to experience that. In other words, if he became my sacrifice for death, he doesn't want me to be concerned about it because he's delivered me from it. If he sacrificed, he's a sacrifice, then he paid the price for me. I don't have to worry about taking my last breath on earth. I know where I'm going. Everybody say, I know where I'm going. And he goes on to tell us in verse 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, how many know we're flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Was Jesus flesh and blood? Yes, he was. That he through death, everybody say through death, that he through death might what? Destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, who had the power of death. The devil did. Everybody say the devil did. Come on, everybody say the devil did. And what did he do? He used that power to manipulate people and control people. And so many times people have done things or not done things because they were, well, if I do that, I might die. No, I don't want to do that. There have been people that have, should have taken ministry calls and missionaries going into foreign countries. They didn't want to do it because, listen, the thought came to their mind, if you do that, you could die over there. Oh, I don't want to do that. I want to stay here and miss God. The enemy has done that. He speaks to you and I in our lives on a regular basis, and he'll use something like the virus. But his ultimate goal is he wants you to think you're going to die. And if he can get you to think that way, you're not going to think life. You're not going to think living. You're going to miss it. Remember, he's my substitute. He's not only my substitute for sin. He's my substitute for sickness and disease. He's my substitute for the curse of the law. But he's my substitute over death, hell, and the grave. I don't have to be fearful of going to I'm not going to go to heaven, or I'm not going to go to hell. I don't have to be fearful of hell. Come on, church. I'm not going to die. I said, I'm not going to die. I said, I'm not going to die. I'm not going to die. Maybe you are, but I'm not going to die. And I'm not basing my faith. And I'm, Well, you're just being arrogant. No, I'm just saying what Jesus said. He said, believe me, and you'll never die. I just believe what he said. I'm not going to die. He's talking to spirit man. Everybody say, I'm not going to die. Say it again. Come on. Say it like you mean. I'm not going to die. And he goes on to tell us. He said what? Death. He said Satan had the power of death. That is the devil. Verse 15. 
and delivered them. Who's our deliverer, church? Everybody say, Jesus is my deliverer. And delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to what church? What does the fear of death do? It puts you in bondage. Does God want us to be in bondage? No, he does not. Jesus delivered you and I from the fear of death. The next time he starts telling you you're going to die, just go, no kidding, stupid. If the Lord tarries another 50 years, another 75 years, I know I'm going to die, but I'm not going to die. And he's going to go, you just said you're going to die and you're not going to die. What are you going to talk about? Well, Mr. Devil, since you're void of revelation, I'll give you a revelation. My body may die. It's going to take last breath, but I am not going to die. I'm going to be with Jesus, and I'm going to heaven. But I am not going to die. And if he says it to you again, just say, I'm just telling you the Bible says I'm not going to die. And always have the last word with the devil. Everybody say, I'm not going to die. Do I have to be fearful about it? Do you have to be fearful about it? No, no. Listen, if you do, the enemy will put you in bondage. You've been delivered today. That's something we don't hear about the resurrection morning. Jesus delivered me from the fear of death. I don't have to be afraid of dying. I'm not afraid of dying. Everybody say, I'm not afraid of dying. Everybody say, I'm not afraid of dying. How many of you know it's something you don't want to practice a lot? You know, sometimes the TV shows, well, we brought him back to life five times. How many of you remember Mark Duplantis? Mark Duplantis spoke here, well, probably 10, 12 years ago. It's Jesse's brother. Uh, Jesse Duplantis is Mark. And... Um, Probably seven, eight years ago, he had a heart attack, and they brought him back to life seven times. Everybody say seven times. And I've talked to him since then, and this happened several years ago. And uh, I, said, I said, Mark, I mean, did, did you see anything? Did you feel anything? I mean, tell me what happened. He said, nope. He said, they just told me I kept dying and kept coming back, dying and coming back, dying. Yeah, do you understand, Mark? That's how he's, no, I'm dying and come back, dying and come back. I said, well, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to stay for a while, bless God. He said, anybody dying and coming back, dying and coming back, seven times, got to hang around, tell somebody. Glory to God. I mean, that's not a testimony. Everybody said, oh, man, no, no piece of cake. I died seven times. Here I am. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Everybody say, I'm not going to die. I'm going to live. And so notice, Jesus delivered us from the fear of death. Everybody say, Jesus delivered me from the fear of death. Now, stay with me. We're going to start going really, 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 really fast. Hallelujah. So what's going on? He commissions them. Matthew chapter 28. He commissions them. But why? We're getting rid of the fear. What does he tell them in verse 7? He said, and go quickly. Everybody say, and go quickly. Go quickly and do what? You got to go tell the disciples. Everybody say, got to go tell the disciples. As a matter of fact, look in verse 7. Verse 7, I want you to underline two words. Notice it says, go quickly and tell. Notice this next two words, his disciples. Everybody say, his disciples. Whose disciples were they? They were his. Everybody say, they were his. Can you see the relationship here? Everybody say, they were the disciples of the Lord. How many of you know you're the same thing? You're his disciples. Ready for this? Go down to verse 8. Here we go again. The very last part of verse 8, it says, and to bring his disciples. Everybody say his disciples. Come on, everybody say his disciples. Every time you hear that, think, that's me, bless God. God's talking about me that way. Notice verse 9. And as they went, and as they went to tell his disciples, disciples. Everybody say his disciples. Notice verse 10. Everybody say his disciples. Are you one of his disciples? How many of you are one of his disciples? Raise your hands up. Absolutely. Verse 10. Then said Jesus. Now Jesus is speaking to them. The angel said they're Jesus' disciples. They're his disciples. They're his disciples. It gets better. Then said Jesus unto them, be not afraid. Go tell my, what church? My brother. Everybody say, my brother, that they go. Everybody say, my disciples. Everybody say, I'm a disciple and I'm a brother. 
Everybody say, I'm a disciple. I'm a brother. So he told him, go quickly. Go tell him why. we got to get the good news. Everybody say, we need to hear the good news. The disciples had to hear the good news. Why do they need to hear the good news? Read and study the Gospels. What's going on with the disciples? His disciples. What goes on with disciples when something goes haywire and you don't know what's going on? Or you forget what the Word says. The Bible says they were in fear and they were hiding because they were in fear of the Jews. They were thinking, oh, no. He's dead. He's gone. We followed him. We went all of these towns, all of these villages. We helped him in the ministry. He trained us in the ministry, and now he's gone. We already know that the Jews were trying to kill him. Oh, no. What are they going to do to us? Probably the same. So they're in hiding. Everybody say they're in hiding. That's what happens when we forget something God told us. When we don't know the word, we go into hiding. I pull back. I'm not sure. Don't understand. Don't know what's going on. I just better pull back here a little bit. And so they're hiding. So he said, go quickly. Everybody say, go quickly. And so we know that they went quickly. And it says, and they departed quickly. Everybody say, they left quickly. As a matter of fact, if you go back and read it, it says they were running. Verse 8 says, everybody say they were running. Notice they didn't walk quickly. They were running. What were they doing? They were going to his disciples. Everybody say to his disciples. And what are they doing? They're, they have a message to them. By the way, he's alive. Everybody say he's alive. Come on, everybody say he's alive. Everybody say Jesus is alive. Now go back to Roman. No, go back to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Is he alive today? Do you need to be fearful of dying? You don't have to be fearful of dying. You're not going to die. Your body is going to stop temporarily, but even one day it's coming back. Your body's going to have a comeback, and it's going to be a glorified body. Now, notice here in Revelation chapter 1, notice something. This is a picture. The whole book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ. We think it's about the end times, but no, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice, if you would, please. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1. Let's go to verse 17. Revelation 1, verse 17. We've been talking on Wednesday nights about keys. Everybody say keys. And Jesus gave the church two keys in Matthew chapter 16 and Matthew chapter 17. The two keys that Jesus gave the church, the believer, he gave to you, one key is to bind and one key is to loose. Everybody say one key is to loose. Come on, everybody say one key is to loose. One key is to bind. He gave those keys to the church. He has those keys now, and he gave them to you and I. It's your responsibility to bind and loose. Notice in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. Stay with me now. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. Do you have to be afraid of dying? No. Glory to God. Jesus destroyed that fear. You don't have to let the enemy give you fear over that situation. Notice in verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Talking about the power of God. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the what, church? The last. This is Jesus speaking now. Jesus is resurrected. John is getting this revelation on the Isle of Patmos. The church is full mode. They're going forward. There's churches established. Chapter 2 and chapter 3 tells us about different churches that he mentioned, seven different churches. They're going. They're moving forward. They've been around for a few years now, and he gets this revelation. And here's what Jesus said to him, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that, what church, liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive, what church? Forevermore. Everybody say forevermore. Is Jesus going to be alive forevermore? If he's going to be alive forevermore, are you going to be alive forevermore? Absolutely. Now notice, here's keys. Everybody say, there's some keys. Aren't you glad he's got them? Notice he said in verse 18, he said, I am alive forevermore, amen. In other words, so be it. And have the keys of hell and of death. Who has the keys of hell and death? 
Jesus does. He now has the power. The enemy was promoting death. Jesus is promoting life. And he said, by the way, guys, when I come out of that grave, I got these keys from that deceiver, and I just want to put it down on paper. And every time you read it, I just might be up here in heaven going, hey, Mr. Devil, just want you to know my kids know they're not fearful of dying, they're not fearful of hell, and they're not fearful of the grave because I have the keys. By the way, when the devil used these keys, he put people into bondage. When Jesus uses these keys, he liberates people. Come on, church. He has set us free. Everybody say, I've been set free. Now, go back real quickly. Who's got the keys? Everybody say, Jesus does. Absolutely. Who's got the power? Jesus does. So what's happened? Death has been conquered. Jesus is alive. The women accept their commission and they obey. And notice they're going to go tell the good news. What's the good news? He's alive. He's alive. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Sometimes we think that the sermon, the first sermon we preach has got to be long and extravagant. No, listen, God may give you one word in due season for somebody, and that's all you need to tell them. Listen, it's not based on how long you can speak or how short you can speak. It's if you're saying what God says to, for you to say and God to do, you've been obedient. That's why in the New Testament sometimes we have, in the Old, the Old Testament we'll have what we call minor prophets and major prophets. What's the difference, Pastor? Really, man labels them major and minor prophecies based on the length of their writing. But how many of you know this? If God gives you one word and you say it, you've been found obedient. Don't minimize one word. Don't minimize one act of obedience. God doesn't judge you according to how long something is. He judges were you faithful over the little. Did you do it? These ladies are busy. They're going to go, and they're going to tell those disciples why. Got to get them out of fear. Everybody say, got to get them out of fear. And so what are they doing? They're bringing a message of hope. They're bringing a message of love, and they're bringing a message of faith to get restored to them. Now, go back to verse, let's continue, verse 9. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and met him by the feet and worshiped him. Well, you do the same thing now. Now, notice they were acting on a word from an angel. They hadn't seen Jesus. Now, because of their obedience, they meet the master on the way home. And verse 10, then said Jesus unto them, be not afraid. Everybody say, be not afraid. Do you know, understand how many times it said, don't be afraid, 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 don't be afraid. Look at your name and go, don't be afraid. Tell somebody, say, don't be afraid. Matter of fact, point, everybody stand up real quickly. Stand up real quickly. Come on. Stand up real quickly. Stir yourself up. Point to somebody and say, do not be afraid of anything, and do not be afraid of hell, death, or the grave. Jesus has the keys. Hallelujah. Now be seated. Then said Jesus unto them, be not afraid. Go tell thy brethren. We notice his disciples, 7, 8, and 9, now he said, my brethren, that's a relationship. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there, everybody say, and there. And there shall they what? Shall they see me. What did they do? Let's go all the way to verse 18. Now comes the commission, the great commission. It even says it in my Bible, the great commission. Go back and read Mark chapter 16. talks about the great commission. What was he doing? He got those men back into faith. I'm alive. Have faith in me. I told you I was coming back. I have all kinds of scriptures to tell you, but I'm not going to do it. But go back and read it how many times. He told them before it ever happened, in three days, guys, I'm coming back. Three days, I'm coming back. You know something very interesting? Thank you, Holy Ghost. It's interesting. Jesus' enemies, the religious people, they remembered it. But his own disciples that saw more signs, miracles, and wonders and heard more of the word than anybody else, they didn't. Isn't that amazing? Why? Probably because those guys knew if he comes back to life again, we're in trouble. Well, how many of you know? He did come back, and they were in trouble. And listen, 
And religious people have been in trouble ever since. But thank God we got a relationship. Everybody say, I got a relationship. And so what did he do? Verse 18 comes the Great Commission. Everybody say the Great Commission. Point yourself and say the Great Commission is just for me. This is for everybody. That's why it's in the Bible. That's why it's printed down. Why he wants his men, his disciples, his disciples, his disciples, his brethren to do what? Get out of fear and to get into faith. Listen, if he couldn't get them back into faith, then they won't move out. They won't do what they're told. They won't do what they said. Listen, they won't lay hands on the sick. It takes some faith in today's society to go lay hands on the sick. Some people act like leprosy is around. Stay away from me. Don't touch me. But the Bible says lay hands on Can I lay hands on you? The Bible says, see, listen, just don't tell them you want to lay hands on them. They might think you might want to punch them. They don't know what laying hands is. We use terminology in the church sometimes that people outside go, I don't got a clue what you're talking about. I was at a restaurant with my brother and my sister and my mom and dad at a restaurant, and I seen a gentleman who was probably in his early 80s that I'd known since I'd been a little kid, and I would see him periodically, and every time he always knew me by first name. He's at the restaurant. We're finishing up our meal. We're all there having a family get-together. This just happened like a month ago. And I was, uh, we were all talking, and he came up, and he was beginning to talk to us, and he said, how are you, Kevin? I said, I'm doing good. He said, you're the preacher over there in Fort Littleton. I said, I am, sir. Yes, I am. And, and I thought the man was saved. But afterwards, I'm like, I don't know. Thought he was. Seemed like always a very, very good moral person. Don't know in all of my years, probably known him, I'm 61, probably, probably 50 years. I don't know if I've ever heard him say a foul word about anybody or even, even say a cuss word. And I thought my mother had told me one time that, that he went to a church. But I made the statement. I said, oh, yeah. I said, he said, you're over there where that bar used to be. And I said, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I said, we're over there. Yeah. I said, we're still serving drinks. It's the Holy Ghost now. And when I said that, he went like this. And I knew right then and there he had no clue what I was talking about. He was thinking that we're still serving alcoholic beverages. And shortly thereafter, he left. And I said, Lord, I'm sorry. I, I repent, Father. I, I didn't mean to hurt that man or, or lead, lead that man astray. I just thought he was a Christian. And I could say that in a lot of circles, and they'd know exactly what I was talking about. But I knew right then and there he didn't. And so I repented, Father, I'm sorry. I don't want him to stumble. I don't want him to get the wrong impression. And I said, Lord, and I don't know when, but soon we're going to meet again. I said, Lord, I want to go meet him again, and I want to set the record straight. I got a feeling it might be another Good Friday. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Might not be on a Friday, but it might be another Good Friday. Because I want him to know the truth. Because the way he acted, like, I could just tell. Anybody ever say that to people? And they just go, oh, you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. See, we use lingo in the church, and it's scriptural and biblical, but we just assume other people know it. But that doesn't mean they do. Doesn't mean they do. Everybody say it doesn't mean they do. You talk about the Spirit of God and the Holy Ghost and, and new wine and things like that. Some people go, I have no clue what you're talking about. Well, we just take it for granted around here, but I knew that day he didn't. Notice Jesus said here in verse 18, we're concluding. Glory to God. Aren't you glad he defeated death for you and I? See, he defeated sin because sin, see, death, death is because of sin. That's the wages of sin. Where there's sin, there's going to be death. There's going to be death of some element whether it be mentally, physically, financially, socially, intellectually. When, when it happens, when people get into sin, it gives way to death. Something's going to die. Why? That's the payday. But he defeated all of those, and he did it for you and I. We don't have to be in fear of anything. Hallelujah. We can enjoy our abundant life. Verse 18. Everybody say verse 18. So here they are. Now they're in faith. He's got his mighty men of faith and power now. Now they're ready to go preach the gospel. Now they're ready to go out and do what Jesus told them to do. And he goes on to tell them in verse 8. Everybody say, here's our orders. Come on, everybody say, here's my orders. Here's our orders. What did he say? 
And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me. Underline that in your Bible, if you would, please. Because there was a time that Jesus could not claim that or say it. I'm going to give you a reference. Go back to Matthew, the fourth chapter, Luke, the fourth chapter, where the Holy Ghost led Jesus to be tempted in the wilderness. One of the temptations Satan blatantly said to Jesus, all power has been given to me. It was a temptation. That's because it was true. If you look the word power up, it means power and authority. If it wasn't true, then it wouldn't be a temptation to Jesus. There was a time where Satan had all power and all authority. Hello, church. Guess who has the power now? Same guy that's got the keys. <laughs> Come on, church. Y'all be getting excited. See, we, we've been lied to by the enemy, and we have believed the enemy more than we believe God. Jesus has the keys. Next time you go to a funeral, just envision Jesus going, I got news for you. He's my brother. He's my disciple. He's with me. Don't you go fearing and crying. He's with me. Paul said to be absent from the body of the presence of the Lord. He said it's not just better. He said it's far, far. Heaven is far better. Everybody say heaven is far better. So this, and I looked this same power up, this word power, right here where he said all power is the same Greek word that the enemy said all power. I looked it up. I believe it's 1498 in the Greek. Look it up. Same word. How did he get it? Because he defeated Satan. He defeated death. He defeated the grave. He defeated hell. He defeated the curse. He defeated sin. And who's got the keys, church? Everybody say, the same guy that's got all the power. Who's got all the power now? Jesus does. Now, somebody says, well, Pastor, if that's true, then how come, how come the enemy's having his way? How come he's the God of this world's systems? Because people believe him and not God. You don't have to believe him. But listen, if you don't know what Jesus said and what this word says, you're going to believe him. That's why I need to know the Word so I can believe what Jesus said, what the Father God's Word said, and not believe the enemy. Remember, you and I, we were born into this world system. Our whole thought process, the way we do things, the way we manage, the way we think, the way we act, has been under a demonic influence. Now I come over to the kingdom of God, I got to renew my mind. Why? It's been corrupted. I have been deceived. I have been lied to. The only way I'm going to undo that and get out of that and walk in what Jesus said he's got the keys for is I have to know the Word of God and enforce it in my life. Notice he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Everybody say, all the power has been given to Jesus in heaven and in earth. Who's the power source today? Not the devil, not the enemy. People talk up the enemy all the time. I mean, they act like the devil, you know, the devil's a nine-foot individual and God's a little three-foot, like a little three-foot army person. No, really, it's the other way around, and we got scripture for it right here. Really, God's the big person and the devil's the little person. But we've talked so much about the enemy that we've made him almost seem like he's more powerful than God. All power. And all authority is in the captain of your salvation's hands. And he's waving them around at the enemy, and there is nothing he can do about it. His only thing is he's hoping you don't get into the Word and read and find differently. That's why he goes out of his way to give you excuses and reasons not to come to church. You come to church, you won't hear the Word. You don't hear the Word, you won't get set free. You don't know the truth. 
so you can't walk in your benefits. You come to church, you hear the word, you get fellowship, iron sharpens iron. You get around the anointing of God, you get around the corporate anointing, you get to encourage one another, you get to bless people, you get to pray for people, and what happens? You get revelation. You get revelation, you get set free. Verse 19, he said, go ye therefore. Everybody say, all power is given to Jesus, all the power in heaven and in earth. So what are we going to do? What's the people of God going to do now that he's got the power? Not the devil, but God, Jesus the head of our salvation, the captain of our salvation, the head of the body of Christ. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Everybody say Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now, you might not know this or not, but now we really know we're in the New Testament because in the Old Testament they didn't refer to Jesus or the Holy Ghost in the Old Testament. They only referred to God. And many times they referred to God as the God of Abraham or the God of our forefathers. Now we're in the New Testament. What's the New Testament? Now it's the Father's plan, sending His Son, and now it's the ministry of the Holy Ghost to the church. And so that's why we're baptized in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the Holy Ghost, because we're in the New Testament. They didn't say that in the Old Testament. He said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am what church? With you always. Is the Lord with you today? Is he going to be with you tomorrow? I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Everybody say it, amen. Close your Bibles. Glory to God. Stand up on your feet. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.